uh, I'll get started. Um, so this is a, a fun lecture for me. Um, I really like working with the medical students and spreading uh, wilderness medicine education to the medical schools. Um, but it's been really, really fun to also have, um, bring some of that to my residency here. So here we have a combined session and really looking forward to talking about um, animal bites, reptile bites, and a general introduction to wilderness medicine. Um, this topic, and I'll go ahead and share my screen. Please let me know if anyone has issues with seeing that. I'm going straight to my PowerPoint. Um, David, are you seeing that okay? The PowerPoint? Thank you, buddy. Um, so I ripped this off of my last presentation when I taught the IU AWS course. Um, something you need to know is about this guy, uh, Dr. Rich Ingebretson. Um, so he was biking in the foothills behind the University of Utah and came across someone injured in a biking accident. Um, he realized at that time, despite being trained um, as an internist, he really didn't know how to under respond to a situation outside of his ER or outside of his clinic. Um, and he said at that time, I realized both times he references that and then a, a rafting incident. Um, I felt unsure of how I could help someone injured in the backcountry and away from modern medical equipment. So he went on to found advanced wilderness life support using principles from ACLS and other standardized um, protocol to give us a protocol standardized to use in wilderness medicine. And Dr. Ingebretson, um, I hold him in very high esteem. I think he is the, he is the uh, Mr. Rogers of wilderness medicine or the Bob Ross. Um, to me, uh, these are kind of the, the earthly trinity of really, really nice people. And he's given me authorization to basically take AWS free of charge to any medical student or resident in the United States. And this is a certification that attendings go to CME and pay, uh, I think, $800, $900 for. Um, but he, he really wants this to be spread to all medical students so they can turn around and teach and just help people be better versed in wilderness medicine. Um, I, for undergrad, went to Southern Utah University and then the University of Utah School of Medicine. That's where I met Rich. Um, and I'm a current resident at IU, IUH Ball Family Medicine Residency Program. Uh, so a lot different than where I grew up in the West, um, but I did want to pursue excellent family medicine education. Um, and so my wilderness medicine was something I wanted to keep doing, but not necessarily a factor in my residency decision. And here I am in Muncie. Um, also, a few months ago, officially started pursuing my fellow of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine fellowship. Um, that is a uh, performance and curriculum based fellowship that I hope to finish before I finish residency. Um, I've been very blessed through the University of Utah to teach wilderness medicine uh, in a few different places. The top left here uh, is in Jackson, Wyoming. This is actually Grand Teton National Park. Um, as I was taking this photo, I turned around and there was a mother moose and her calf there. So I actually stayed out on my little rock island where I was taking this photo until I saw them on the other end of the lake. Um, and something we'll go into in this lecture is situational awareness. A really good way to get severely injured is to bother a bull moose with her calf. Um, top right is Agui de Midi in France. Um, it's a cable car you ride up into the French Alps. Um, we teach this course every year in Chamonix, France. Um, and that's available to med students and residents if any of you are interested. Um, bottom left was when we taught in Zion National Park. And then bottom right is Canyonlands near Arches where we teach a practical skills part of this course. Um, you'll find me referencing time and time again, uh, growing up in the Uinta Mountains in Northeastern Utah. Um, on the top right, you can see where I've pegged it. Uh, I'm from a little town 
um, between Camus and Coville on that left or on that uh, map on the left. And my stories go back time and time again to some of my experiences growing up. I hope you don't mind. Um, so that's a little intro, kind of why me, how I get on, got involved. Um, and the topic for today is going to be North American mammals, snakes, and rabies. Um, focusing more specifically on uh, uh, mammalian carnivores, um, I mentioned the moose, um, but we won't delve too much into herbivore attacks, but I do want to talk in depth about mammals, um, snakes, and then something that I developed to put into this slide was a little bit more about um, rabies. So I think this is why a lot of people want to study wilderness medicine. It's just fun to talk about these animals. It's fun to talk about the medical implications. It's fun to feel like um, these wild things can happen, and they do. Um, Unlike some other conditions, it is hard to track the incidence of wild animal attacks. A lot of it goes unreported. Sometimes there's, most states have no mandatory reporting. So the statistics we show out, uh, throw out here, take with a grain of salt. Um, one thing that's universal, whether we're talking about a moose, whether we're talking about a deer, a raccoon, we have to think about the animal and the reason for the attack. And uh, the textbook that I studied in preparation for this lecture really laments the number of people who go out into these areas of the wilderness and have no idea about the animals they might encounter and really have no idea about animal behavior. And that's something that, that you can study as part of wilderness medicine, learning about these animals, learning how they act. Um, I'm comfortable around different animals that I've spent a lot of time around. Um, farm animals, um, I've been around a lot of elk, a lot of deer, uh, a lot of mountain lions. Now, if you put me around a wolf, I'm not going to know as much, but I have studied the subject. And a lot of people are attacked or put them in situations where they can be attacked by wild animals simply because they do not know about wild animal behavior and what could provoke an attack. Uh, the final point here, animal attacks in general, to get into these areas where you might be attacked by something like a bear, you're going to be a long way from definitive care. So management is really important. If you are in your group of backcountry explorers and you're the uh, de facto medical person you, you need to have this on the top of your head because you might have a long time before uh, you can get definitive help. Uh, my red arrows here are gonna cover subjects um, relevant to this discussion. Um, now I am focusing more on North American animals, so I'll really from here only be mentioning the dog. Um, but we see human deaths from animals, uh, mosquitoes and other people kill us a lot more than anything I'm going to be talking about. But the subjects I'm going to be talking about are very romanticized. Um, so we see them a lot more in the news, disproportionate to how often it actually happens. Um, now, if we're exploring the backcountry and other parts of the world, crocodiles, tigers, elephants, lions, hippos are common. Um, most Wild animal mortality in India, uh, most wild, fatal wild animal attacks, um, and this might have changed very recently, but caused by tigers. Um, so wherever you are, evaluation, initial treatment is going to be the same. Look for blunt trauma injury, explore penetrating, penetrating trauma for neurovascular damage, and then we'll go over again and again antibiotic use. I want the residents and med students, I really hope you walk away from this lecture with a couple points on either your step exams or the family medicine boards. Um, when I lectured on, when I lectured on um, altitude illness right away, um, that helps some people get points on different board exams. So I hope this is the same. Um, Remember that bites are considered tetanus prone, regardless of where they come from, and we wanna make sure that's updated. Um, 
and then consider the need for rabies prophylaxis, which we'll go into in more depth. Um, I really enjoy breaking things down by species, um, and I don't think there's anything that's much more fun to talk about than bear attacks. It's the classic, um, uh, when we talk about the sympathetic response in med school, for some reason, someone's always being chased by a bear. Um, so our North American species, black bear, polar bear, and brown bear. Um, uh, like I said, it's important to know about the species that will be in the area you're traveling to. So this is the distribution of the North American black bear. As you see on the left, uh, uh, North American black bear is not always black. Um, the top left is a what some call a spirit bear um, from the western coast of British Columbia, and they're uh, almost almost white in color. Uh, we have a cinnamon colored black bear in the middle, and then our typical something we might see in the Smokies, um, black colored black bear. You see very widely distributed in Canada, and then kind of have their mountain enclaves throughout the United States. Um, where I'm from, I've seen I've seen a couple black bears in in the mountain ranges I grew up in in Utah, um, distributed in Colorado, all up the West Coast, and through most of Appalachia, and the Ozarks. So, good chance of seeing a black bear if you're really anywhere in the U.S. away from civilization. Recently, saw a report that um, the first black bear in nearly a hundred years was recently spotted in Nebraska. Um, so their distribution is actually being reintroduced into places they were previously eliminated from. As you can see, there's no dark red um, in Nebraska where they were previously distributed. Uh, this is the brown bear, also known as the grizzly bear. Um, the uh, common scientific term is brown bear and there's no species difference uh, between those that are found in Canada and Alaska and those that are found throughout Russia um, and Eastern Europe. They're distinguished from the, they're distinguished from the black bear by having a little bit more of a curved nose. Um, their paws, as you can see in this image on the bottom left, um, their claws are more straight. Um, they're used more for shoveling, digging out terrain and so when we see an attack by a black bear with their more curved claws, as you can see on the cinnamon bear in the middle, um, those are sharper and lacerate more easily than those of the brown bear. With the brown bear though, they are immensely powerful. So as they do that shoveling motion, um, they can cause these parallel streaks of lacerations. Uh, then we get to the polar bear, um, circumpolar distribution. Uh, can be found in northern Alaska, um, throughout northern Canada. Sometimes um, they do descend pretty far into the Hudson Bay. And with climate change, um, their distribution is changing and some of them are becoming increasingly more continental. Um, some fun bear facts. Lest you think you can be safe from these things at any point, um, they can run 35 to 40 miles per hour. They have decent eyesight. Some experts compare it to human eyesight. Some say it's a little worse. A great sense of hearing and a ridiculously good sense of smell. Um, I put a bloodhound here for reference. Um, the average dog's sense of smell is 100 times better than a human. A bloodhound's is 300 times better than a human. And a bear's sense of smell is seven times better than a bloodhound's or 2,100 times better than a human. So um, a decaying carrion somewhere in the middle of Alaska that has a very strong scent and is carried downwind such as a, um, such as a decaying caribou, there are some experts think, that think that bears could smell that from 20 miles away. Um, general human scent or cars or a boat, um, I've read reports of of bears easily detecting humans one to two miles away. Um, this has implications for hiking and exploring these areas. You need to know if you're um, upwind from a bear, it will probably know that you're coming for one to two miles. 
Um, if you are a hunter with downed game like an elk or a deer, um, that will probably carry all night for two to three miles downwind and you might have a bear waiting for you in the morning when you go to claim your meat. Um, and then finally issue one, a big issue here is if you're actually, um, if you're actually downwind from the bear, um, because that wind carrying your scent away from the bear increases the chance of you surprising the bear. And as we'll discuss that sometimes turns out not too well. Let's see if my video works here. Uh, this illustrates um, this illustrates the speed that these bears can travel at. Um, there's a cinnamon colored bear in the left third of the screen with her cub. And down to the bottom right, there's a pesky black colored bear that's getting a little too close to comfort to this mama bear. So watch her uh, chase this black bear up a tree and just think, like could 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 you move this fast through timber? Climbs a tree like I mean fucking high. Oh, dude. sorry, We're trying to it. mute. There we go. So, um, watch the cinnamon-colored uh, bear, and just ask yourself: Could you move this quickly through timber? There's down timber. There's shrubs. There's everything. And she's she's getting a little annoyed at this black bear, and she's like, "Okay, you're too close for comfort. I'm going to charge you." And look how fast she can move through that down timber. And the black bear has a lead on her, but look how fast she can get up that tree after him. So I share this to illustrate the point. Um, you can't outrun the bear. You can't outclimb the bear. Prevention-wise, you need to know what animals are in your area and how to prevent an attack. Um, this is the official sign um, going into one of the national parks. I think it was the new sign for Yellowstone. Um, be alert, make noise, carry bear spray, avoid hiking alone, and do not run. Um, let me go to my next slide. So I don't know how many of you remember this, but this to me perfectly illustrates a point I want to make about preventing a bear attack. Um, so they're interviewing this guy and they're going to they're gonna prank him and you watch his fight or flight get activated in a split second. Tyrone, are you going to treat him? No. Wrong. <laughs> So you can tell even he's a little remorseful about the fact that he just punched this guy in the face, but he was surprised. So his fight or flight uh, instantly activated. For him being slightly cornered, it was a fight response, and he punched his buddy wearing a gorilla mask in the face. Um, you have to think about that with regard to any wild animals, especially bears. Um, this is reference. Um, this is important because if you are not smelled by the bear, you're not heard by the bear, or not seen by the bear, and you startle the bear, it's going to act out in self-defense. And that is a prominent way that people are attacked by bears. We think uh, 50 to 60% of the time, it's simply you have startled the bear that was not aware of your presence, um, and it's going to attack you. Um, so if the bear is committed to the attack, um, one thing that, that's good to carry on you is, is pepper spray. Carry it on you while in bear country. It has to be with, used within 30 feet, so don't fire it too early before the bear is attacking you. Um, and then be aware of the wind so you don't pepper spray yourself. I've watched videos of this being used. Um, a lot of the times this is actually tested on bears and it's very, very effective. Uh, the conversation comes up a lot about firearms. Um, just logistically, you need to consider um, a shot to a disabling area of a bear is around 12 square inches. Um, and you'd have to be able to pull that shot off in the two to five seconds it takes a charging bear to reach you. Um, I don't like those odds compared to my odds using pepper spray that sprays out in a cloud for up to 30 feet. Um, recent study out of Alaska showed um, 444 armed persons under attack, um, no difference in success rate 
defending yourself from a, a brown bear attack between long guns and handguns and no difference in injury rate whether the firearm was discharged or not. So statistically speaking, um, the role of firearms in bear defense would just be if that bear is going to kill you no matter what. Um, and most of the time, as we discussed, bear attacks are, are usually just to eliminate a threat from a startle response. Their intention is not to eat you. Um, this does change a little bit by species. Um, so if you encounter a brown bear, a grizzly, um, here's the, here is the, the advice. Don't look into the bear's eyes. If spotted by a bear, allow it to see you as a human. Step forward into the full view of the bear so that it, it isn't wanting to investigate you more. It's not wondering if you're a deer. Step into the full view, let it know that you're a human. Um, I chose this cheesy clip art suit guy here because um, I wanted to say do not run or make sudden movements. Pre present a very neutral appearance to the bear. Do not act aggressively, but still stand your ground. Um, I've seen videos of, of uh, different people pulling this off and, and it, it's talking to the bear, it's yelling at the bear, it's letting you know, hey, I'm a human. Um, I'm a human, but I'm not a threat to you. If attacked by a brown bear, get into the fetal position. Um, as I read this chapter, my big question was, you know, is the old adage, if it's brown, lie down, if it's black, fight back, is that true? Um, and it actually is totally true. Most brown bear attacks are either defending their cubs or because you've startled them. And as soon as it eliminates you as a threat, which is usually from a very brief, intense attack, it will leave you alone. So you lie down, you cover your neck and head, and after the attack is over, you be sure to give enough time for that bear to wander away. Don't stand up too early and make the bear think that they haven't eliminated their threat because then you'll get the second attack, which is usually more uh, intense than the first. If it's black, fight back. Um, so this is a picture of my wife and I um, up on the up on the AT. Um, near where we took this picture, we came across a section hiker. Um, experienced woman in her late 40s, early 50s. And we all rested on the trail and had a chat and just started talking about how her hike was going. And she told us, well, last night was a little interesting. Um, I had a bear trying to break into my shelter. And uh, my wife and I were a little taken aback, um, but she matter of factly just told us how this brown bear was sniffing around the, uh, the shelter that she was staying in on this section hike. Um, and she watched it, she was patient with it, but then when it got a little too close to her, she kicked it in the nose um, and it, it ran away scared. Uh, black bears, encounters with black bears are a little bit different because they tend when they're attacking to be doing it for for a um a predation purpose they're they're usually have decided at that point to commit to trying to eat you um part of that is is our fault as humans conditioning them that up on the at at these shelters, we throw our garbage into trash cans and bears learn to associate humans with food. And so a lot of these black bears in their wide distribution um, have learned humans equal food. And if they're really hungry, um, if they attack you, that might be their reason for doing it. So it's a, it's a different approach to black bears. If they are acting aggressively, you yell, you throw things, you intimidate them, you charge them, you wave your arms, and if the bear makes contact with you, you're fighting with all you have left because it's most oh, likely going to eat uh, you. Cooper is giving a talk on wilderness medicine. So he's talking about bear attacks. Hey, Dr. E, you're not muted. <laughs> um, prevention goes back a long way. And it goes back to 
well, anytime you check into a national park that has bears, um, don't feed a bear, keep your campsite free of garbage, um, store food in approved bear containers, um, and never, never, never approach a mother bear with her cub. Uh, not too much of an issue for um, us sometimes as Americans or as us who are interested in wilderness medicine um, that on a trip up to the Grand Tetons, um, we ran across a group of tourists when we were looking around a lake. And this group of a tourists approached my wife and I, and they were very excited. That, and they said, baby bear, baby bear. And, and they were drifting closer uh, to the edge of the lake. And uh, we're like, we are already way too close to this baby bear if there's a baby bear over there. Um, I glanced around the lake and it turns out it was just a huge beaver and the tourists didn't know the difference between a beaver and a bear. Um, so we got to teach them about that. But the situa situational awareness is very important. And if you're in a group with someone who's not aware of these things, teach them a little bit about animal behavior. Because um, if there were a baby bear in that situation, um, a, a grizzly bear mama would have been munching on some tourists. So, um, Follow the March protocol, your ABCs um, in, treating, in treating these wounds. Um, look for fractures and look for occult bleeding, um, especially these brown bears are immensely powerful and with a swat of their paw, they can rupture internal organs. So even if you don't see superficial damage or lacerations, um, you, you have to consider those areas of major bleeding that thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, the thigh, um, where blunt force trauma might be causing occult bleeding. And then um, be sure to evacuate for definitive care in these situations. Um, Riz, really busy slide here from up to date, but this is your wound care management. Control the bleeding, clean the wound with soap and water, some iodine, or another antiseptic solution, and then provide local anesthesia followed by irrigation. You wanna pressurize this irrigation and just clean, 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 clean these wounds as much as you can. You are just trying to grossly debulk this of as much bacteria as you can. If there is already necrotic tissue or clearly um, devitalized tissue, um, some local anesthesia will allow you to um, debride that tissue and not allow it to be um, an area where bacteria can set up. But control the bleeding, clean, 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 antiseptic solution, pressure wash, pressure wash, pressure wash, clean, 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 clean. And then the decision comes later, primary closure versus closure with secondary intention. Um, I'm not gonna to go too deeply into that other than you have to consider cosmetic outcomes and the vascularity of the area. Most facial wounds can be immediately closed both for cosmetic outcomes and because it's so highly vascular, we can deal with infections there more easily. Um, wounds to the hands, wounds that are more than 12 hours old. If someone's immunocompromised, you have to think about these things, crush injuries or puncture injuries. Um, we don't want to close those and give a perfect little pocket for bacteria to set up. We want to be covering for gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes. Um, all of those are common in uh, all of those are common in wounds from dogs, from bears, from most any of these animals we're talking about. And fortunately, there is a great antibiotic, Augmentin that covers gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes. Um, if, you, if you look on uh, about halfway down, augment and mox clav um, covers the spectrum of most of the bacteria we would get in one of these wounds. Uh, and there's alternative therapy listed there, but that's where you might get some points on your boards. Um, we go back to where I grew up. This is a, a nice little rainbow trout I caught one winter um, on the Weber River. And um, just, uh, just a little north of here, 
um, is some of our family property. And one year I was deer hunting by myself, not seeing any deer at all, but what I did see on the ground was one of those. Um, and that is a print from a mountain lion. Um, widely distributed um, throughout North and South America. Um, the yellow... Hey, Molly, you're not muted. Um, widely distributed throughout North and South America. The yellow shows their previous range limit. Um, the red shows their current range limit. Um, I um, have probably in the wild seen, I don't know, five or six mountain lions just through the different things I've been involved in. And they've always struck me as being uh, very, very uh, house cat-like. Evolutionarily, we see that um, that's actually true. They're more closely related to domestic cats than um, lions, tigers, jaguars, um, other other members, other feline, uh, large, other large cats like that. Um, one issue we're seeing with mountain lions uh, right now is increased recreation into, into their habitat. And a huge problem is increased housing development. Um, in these areas in Southern California, people are building more and more and more into the foothills. And they're more and more and more encroaching on the territory of these mountain lions, um, who, unlike some types of bears, unlike some types of other animals, don't they don't really know how to live with humans. Um, that situational awareness I mentioned earlier is really important. When I when I was in this area near my hometown, um, I was watching for signs of animals and realized there could be a mountain lion very close to me because I was watching for tracks. Um, mountain lions are are very threatening because um, they they might see you as prey, just like a house cat. If they're hungry and see you as a potential target. Um, they, they stalk, they pounce, and they go for your cervical spine. Um, sometimes you, you see a human death from a bear, a human death from a different animal, um, and, and they're left there, you know, unmolested after the threat is over. Most of the time when you read the literature on mountain lion attacks, um, they have, if the, if the victim is not found for two or three days, they're almost completely eaten by the mountain lion. So it's important to understand that if the cougar is stalking you or attacking you, it thinks you are lunch and you need to fight back with everything you have. Any object available, do not run away and activate the prey, the, the prey instinct of the cougar. Um, if it's attacking you, you, you need to fight it off, cause enough pain that it wants to leave you alone. Um, this is a video shot um, in near Provo, Utah, um, in an area of the Wasatch Range. Um, this hiker was walking along and thought he found a group of bobcat kittens. Um, he was very surprised to learn shortly thereafter they were not bobcats at all, but they were um, cubs of this mama mountain lion. And she proceeded to um, chase him down the trail for about six minutes. So some things he did not do well was situ situational awareness, um, investigating these quote unquote bobcats too closely um, before realizing they were cubs of this mountain lion. Um, what he does do well is keep his eyes on the mountain lion, slowly back away. He makes threatening gestures while retreating and he never turns his back because as you can see with her being 15 yards away, if he turned his back and ran, um, it would not end well for him. And he continues down the hill um, like this for about six minutes. You can see her threatening. And we think more trying to just get him very far away from her um, kittens. But uh, this, is a, this is a little, I think, eight-year-old uh, down in New Mexico 
who was attacked by a mountain lion, has these superficial abrasions, both from teeth and from claws. Um, we had 10 states report 74 cougar attacks from 1924 to 2018. And as you're out in the wilderness with your family, something very important to consider is um, almost half of these attacks are in kids less than 18 years old and 35% of attacks were on those less than 10 years old. You have to keep your family close to you, keep them aware because as with any predator, they are going to look for the younger, the weaker um, of whatever species they're stalking. If that happens to be humans, they attack kids way more often. Um, in those attacks reported, 16 victims were hospitalized. None of the victims who were hospitalized die died, but 11 of those attacks were fatal. Um, and Dr. Whit makes a very strong point. Um, you can't gain a very wide social media following if you are dead. Um, so um, be aware of that and keep yourself safe. Um, we'll discuss uh, canines very quickly. Uh, on the top right is my dog, Ted. We had unfortunately had to put him down. Um, he was uh, my buddy since sophomore year of uh, high school. But I found this picture of him and dangling from his collar, you can see his proof of rabies vaccination. Um, rabies from domestic dogs is not a huge issue in the United States because of our effective programs. But if you are going on an adventure to India, um, stray dogs cause more than 95% of rabies in India. Um, canine attacks in general, whether we're dealing with uh, domestic dogs, um, coyotes, um, bites are more prevalent in children, both because children don't understand animal behavior, they roughhouse, or in the case of some wild animals, they become um, easier targets. As I mentioned with mountain lions, um, we're having big problems with encroachment on the territory of the coyote. And so in that same area of California, I mentioned that struggling with cougars, uh, we're struggling with coyotes. Since the 70s, more than 100 coyote attacks on humans have been recorded in Southern California. Around half were less than 10 years of age. Um, and, um, and increasingly coyotes, and we'll discuss it, are becoming more bold and seeing humans as a food source. Um, on the bottom right, um, a Canadian folk singer, she actually won a national recognition for being an up and coming folk singer, uh, was actually killed in a national park in Nova Scotia by a group of coyotes who had become too accustomed uh, to human interaction. Um, this is the range of the coyote and it's an animal that's actually thriving in the face of increased, um, uh, increased in, in the face of, um, how should I say, more, more people um, living in cities and suburban areas and expanding, as I said, into the foothills. So before 1700, their range was confined mostly to the Intermountain West and the Great Plains um, but today you can see they are spreading north, they're spreading east and west. Um, I saw coyotes sprinting through the middle of Dallas, Texas, the most urban place maybe I've ever been. Um, they've, they've, they've adapted very well to he eating human waste. Um, and it's an inc interaction with coyotes is increasingly a problem. Um, this is the distribution of the gray wolf um, found throughout Alaska, Canada, and um, large parts of Asia. Um, you can see this dip down. There are wolves in northern Idaho and areas of um, Washington and Montana as well. Um, wound beha wolf behavior, uh, it's a little less threatening. Um, there aren't as many wolves that attack humans and generally they're very skittish and try to avoid human contact. Although there are, there are examples in the literature of, of um, packs of wolves being accustomed to humans 
and starting to view them as a food source. Um, in general, though, they, they are shy, reclusive, and try and avoid humans if at all possible. If you're bitten by a coyote or a dog or a wolf, we go back to the same thing, control bleeding, investigate the wound, clean it with soap and water, irrigate, 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 debride, um, devitalize tissue, and then consider primary versus secondary closure. Dogs carry in their mouths gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes. A great medication for treating those things is Augmentin. My buddy who's in residency uh, in Rhode Island sent me this. These are your three choices of starter Pokemon in Tennessee. Um, so you can choose between the possum, the raccoon, and the skunk. But here's our pop quiz. Um, and you can, uh, you can chat me up if you want. <clears throat> but globally, what is the most common form of viral encephalitis? Question number two. In season five, episode 20 of Scrubs, what causes Dr. Cox's mental breakdown? Number three, a former CDC branch chief famously said, local treatment is perhaps the single most effective means of preventing this disease. Number four, original vaccine for this disease was made by drying rabbit spinal cords for 14 days after slaughter because 15 day old cords were no longer infectious and thus could not confer immunity. Number five, another form of the vaccine has been described as the crudest biological material administered to humans. Number six, two of the three Tennessee starting Pokemon on the previous page are important vectors of this disease. Uh, the answer to this is rabies on all accounts. Um, it's the most common form of viral encephalitis. Um, in season five of Scrubs, Dr. Cox authorizes organ transplant from a patient who passes away. Um, she was suspected of being a drug addict and having died from a drug overdose with other concomitant mental issues, um, but she actually passed away from rabies. Um, and all of the organ transplant recipients died from rabies. Uh, you might just see this as Hollywood, um, but this has actually happened both in the United States and Germany. Um, four patients who received organ transplant um, from a deceased patient passed away in the United States in the, uh, I think, 2000s. And then shortly thereafter, the th same thing happened in Germany. Um, Louis Pasteur's vaccine was originally created using um, rabbit spinal cords. Um, and a vaccine that is sometimes still used in developing countries um, is, is um, um, is grown in culture in live animals, including rodents. And the brain material of those rodents is administered directly into humans, making it the crudest biological material administered to humans as part of the vaccine. Of our Tennessee starting Pokemon, um, both skunks and raccoons are huge vectors in the United States. Um, the raccoon, um, so we got some comments here. Uh, Lufon brings up a good point. Opossums are naturally resistant to rabies due to lower body temps completely true. That's why they're not a big vector. Also, they eat ticks. So I'm a big fan of the possum, which use him as my starting Pokemon. Um, and then we have uh, Liam Neeson fighting wolves. Is this an evidence-based way to fight off a wolf? I would say if a wolf is actively trying to eat you, yes, use anything you have, sharp objects, whatever you'd like. Um, so Western U.S., we see issues in the Great Plains with the skunk. Um, in New Mexico and Arizona, the fox was a big vector, um, as it is in the Arctic fox up in Alaska. And then in our neck of the woods, we're struggling with raccoons. If you look at this border 
of Ohio with Pennsylvania, um, that was an area where Ohio authorized a huge vaccination program to try and keep rabies from spreading into from Pennsylvania into Ohio and involved um, airdropping bait throughout the border area to um, vaccinate raccoons against rabies so we could keep it from spreading into Ohio. In Puerto Rico, watch out for those mongoos, if that's the plural. Um, rabid dogs. This is an area of, of um, this map shows distribution of dogs tested for rabies. And then the red dots show rabid dogs. So we test lots of dogs for rabies, but it's not a huge vector due to vaccination programs. Um, foxes actually are an increasingly larger vector causing more human rabies, or, or I should say, more often, rabid foxes that are tested for rabies are found to have rabies, as is indicated by the red dots, through that same distribution I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're so successful with vaccinating dogs that cats actually cause more human rabies than dogs in the United States. Um, an issue here is pet ownership. There are feral cats that are used on farms and ranches and not really claimed by anyone. They're just mousers. Um, but sometimes they get rabies and are able to spread it to others. Uh, but the animal we haven't mentioned so far and the largest cause of human rabies in the United States is bats. And that's pretty well distributed throughout urban areas. Um, so that's something we have to have to be considered. Uh, oh yeah, Lauren, I got gotcha. you. Um, so there are two clinical forms of rabies in animals. Uh, a furious form and a dumb form. Furious rabies is what we see in, in popular culture. Um, and this is a linograph print from the Middle Ages showing a rabid dog with the village trying to deal with it. Um, these animals, regardless of what species they are, are usually aggressive, they're erratic. Um, this form is more common in dogs, foxes, skunks, raccoons. Um, there was a report in the United States of a river otter that was thought to be rabid that actually be, um, bit several members of the same family swimming in a river. Um, so any mammal that's acting unusually aggressive, erratic, um, it should be nocturnal, but it's out in the day, it's attacking you, attacking other animals, inanimate objects, consider rabies. Um, dumb rabies causes unusual friendliness or tolerance. This is more common in bats and you find this poor little bat in the trail and it's the middle of the day and it doesn't mind that you approach it and you pick it up and handle it and then you give it a kiss and its saliva spreads to your saliva through your mucous membranes and now you have rabies because uh, that was a bat suffering from the dumb version of rabies. Okay, either of these forms um, can involve ascending or descending paralysis starting in the feet or starting in the, um, in the larynx. Um, an altered gait in these animals, strain vocalizations, or choking. Um, we see the rabid dog in the picture on the top, and we see dogs suffering from dumb rabies below. Um, they're friendly, but clearly suffering from neurogenic consequences. Um, in humans, and this is one reason I wanted to emphasize this um, in this talk, as future healthcare providers, you med students and residents need to have this on your differential diagnosis and ask the question, it was someone possibly exposed to rabies? Um, most times, rabies victims are hospitalized two or three times before the diagnosis is made, and they're brushed off as being either um, a psych patient some other form of encephalitis that's resolving quickly or a run of the mill virus. And it's not until the third hospitalization that someone starts asking about animal exposure do we realize we're actually treating a case of rabies encephalitis. Humans also show kind of in our pathology, furious and dumb rabies. Um, a patient with the furious form, hyperactivity, restlessness, 
agitation, some waxing and waning disorientation and hallucinations. And in patients um, in areas like India, where rabies is a lot more common, um, these patients are extremely distressed because they know that they have rabies because they are waxing and waning and they know the difference between their normal cognition and these hallucinations. Because of this, it's commonly mistaken for a psychological disorder. Um, hydrophobia is present in about a third of patients. And I'm gonna show you this uh, video of someone with hydrophobia. It's not so much that they're terribly afraid of water, it's they have an autonomic reaction, which I'll show you, um, that prevents them from drinking. Um, we can also have the dumb variant in humans, and that's often mistaken for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, so that ascending paralysis needs to be on your, on your differential. Um, you need to have rabies on your differential for that if rather than maybe swimming in an area with Campylobacter, this person was uh, spelunking in a cave and was exposed to bat urine or feces. But let me link out to this. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. And uh, this is a poor guy in Vietnam um, who's, who's recording, recorded experiencing hydrophobia. At the National Institute of Infectious and Tropical Diseases in Hanoi. It's common enough there they diagnose it clinically, but watch as he tries to drink Um, so I wanted to show you that because you might be among the few healthcare providers in the U.S. that is aware of this and can have that on your differential. Um, with regard to rabies prep, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, um, again, be aware of where you're traveling. And if you're the medical leader for a group or working in a clinic and someone approaches you about this, um, you need to do your homework on the area you're traveling to. Um, if someone works in a rabies research lab or if they work with biologics, um, they need pre-exposure vaccination. Someone who is frequently exposed to rabies, like a veterinarian, someone who is spelunking, animal control and wildlife workers. Um, if you have a patient that fits this description, and I would hope their work would mandate it, but um, you, you need to, um, you need to consider rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's recommended for those groups. Okay. No vaccination for the U.S. population at large. Um, travelers to certain areas and veterinary students need to consider it though. Um, rabies post-exposure prophylaxis is guided based on the type and disposition of the animal causing a bite. And most of our errors in rabies treatments are from not observing these recommendations from the CDC. Sometimes we overtreat and sometimes we undertreat. Most of our overtreating comes from dogs, cats, or ferrets that can be observed for 10 days and observed to be healthy. Rabies spreads so quickly through their immune system that if they're in the clear after 10 days, we do not need to be treated with post-exposure prophylaxis. However, if the animal is behaving strangely, clinically appears to be rabid, we would start that prophylaxis right away. Skunks, raccoons, foxes, and most other carnivores, including bats, are record regarded as a rabid animal unless proven negative. And you need to consider immediate prophylaxis 
unless you can capture that animal, uh, refrigerate it, and send its brain to the CDC laboratory to be tested within 24 hours. Most of the time that, tr that testing can happen within 24 hours and it's extremely accurate in a um, reliable lab. Otherwise, you need to consider immediate prophylaxis from those species. Um, the thing that comes up with bats is that rabies can spread through urine, it can spread through saliva, and it can spread through abrasions or lacerations. So I never personally understood why the whole, if you wake up in a room with a bat, you need to be treated for rabies was a thing. But you need to consider if a bat is in your room in the daylight, that's maybe an unusual behavior. And if that was flying around and had any urine, feces, or saliva drop onto any of your mucous membranes, you could contract rabies. So that's why bats, and in addition, um, bats, um, insectiv insectivorous bats and fruit bats, if they bite you, they have very sharp deep uh, teeth that cause very, very small puncture wounds. So you can very be easily be bitten by a bat in your sleep and not know about it. So that's why bats, we have special concern for them. Um, it's just tricky. It's a little bit different than a rabid raccoon walking up and biting you on the ankle in broad daylight. Um, individual consideration for livestock, small rodents, which are very rarely a vector of rabies, um, or large rodent, rodents. You need to consult in these situations your local, um, yeah, your local health department as they will keep tabs on local spread of rabies. Um, so here's the algorithm and this is what will uh, this is what we'll almost end with. If any of you need to run, no worries. Um, so you have a bite or scratch by a mammal, contamination of an open wound or mucous membrane by mammalian saliva or central nervous system tissue. If none of that happened, you don't have to treat. Is there a risk of rabies in the species and geographic area where the exposure occurred? So like I said, talking to your local health department. Yes. Is that a dog or cat in the United States? No, then begin treatment. If that's a dog or cat in the United States and the dog or cat or ferret can be observed for rabies, do not treat. If that dog or cat sickens or dies within 10 days, begin treatment. After you begin treatment, for a non-dog or cat bite in the United States, can that animal's brain be examined for rabies? If the answer is no, you need to complete the course of post-exposure prophylaxis. If the answer is yes, and you can have direct fluorescent antibody test, and that animal tests negative rabies, you can negative for rabies, you can stop treatment. Um, this is an important quote that kind of talks about treatment from beginning to end. Um, prompt and thorough cleansing of the wound and administration of purified equine or human rabies immunoglobulins and cell culture rabies vaccine immediately after exposure virtually guarantee complete protection. And pregnancy and infancy are never contraindications to post-exposure rabies vaccination. If you, as a patient or as a healthcare provider, do this right, you're virtually guaranteed complete protection from rabies. The thing that's often overlooked, especially in other, care, in other countries, is the prompt and thorough cleansing of the wound. You need to clean, clean the wound with soap and water, with um, povidone iodine or some other um, antiseptic solution that's proven to be damaging to rabies, um, and clean, 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 clean. That can remarkably decrease the incident of rabies after a bite. Um, and I'll go back to this. Um, the other areas of treatment um, that will have to be sought in a medical center um, are gonna be immunoglobulins started immediately and rabies vaccine in a series um, started immediately and then given sequentially. 
Um, Lauren asked, do dogs and cats under observation remain in the home or are they isolated to a particular location? Um, that can happen in the home or it can happen in the veterinarian's office, but that isolation um, and observation mandates oversight by a veterinarian. So it's not just um, the owner watching out for signs or symptoms, it's frequent visits from a veterinarian, uh, whatever the setting. Um, I encourage you, if any of these uh, are interesting to you, um, you can do a deep dive into all of this. I started out this lecture wanting to cover, well, I started out research for this lecture wanting to cover uh, mammals, reptiles, arthropods, and ticks and tick-borne illness. And um, I realized quickly after studying more into this, uh, it's so fascinating, all I was going to be able to do was mammals and rabies and maybe not even do it justice. But um, some big hitters, be very suspicious of rabies, um, initiate prompt and thorough cleansing of any wound, whether that's a concern for rabies or a bite or laceration suffered by a wild animal. Um, Augmentin is going to be your best friend because it can treat gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes um, in a lot of these cases of bites. And then just familiarize yourself with endemic disease, wildlife in the area in which you'll be traveling and, and do your homework so that you can avoid some of these more serious illnesses. Um, like I said, no time to go into snakes today, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>